verses 9 through 13. Matthew 6. And as you're turning there, I'd like to lift this up in this message in a word of prayer. Father God, today, as a father, I depend on you as my heavenly father to lead me. So that God, I may take the responsibility and embrace it with all that I have and that we as fathers can embrace you leading us so that we can lead our children and our families. God, there's going to be many in here today that do not have that fatherly example, that don't have that connection to their earthly father. Heavenly Father, you can be all that for them, and I pray that you would do that. For your glory and your honor, we bring nothing to the text, but asking you to speak through it. Let your will be done. Holy Spirit, move. It's in Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. You know, dads, we do get overshadowed sometimes because Mother's Day was not too far back, but I want to tell you not this morning. Because fathers are critical to the home. Mothers are critical as well. They're both critical. It takes a team to raise a child. In fact, it takes a community to raise a child, but it's really hard to do that without a dad. It's possible, but it's hard. You know, to hear feminists speak, the only thing that men are good for or fathers are good for is procreation. Listen, you just provide this part to produce a human. But I want to tell you this morning, I don't believe that. The Bible doesn't support that. Men, fathers, you're for much more use than just bringing a human into this world. Dad, you're a critical part of your family. Not just the Bible says that, but the world says that. Do you know that children that are raised without a father are more likely to live in poverty, have emotional and behavioral disorders, commit suicide, be sexually active before marriage, be involved in some kind of delinquent behavior, and to also get a divorce when they grow up and have a wife? Dads are critical. Do you know that 90% of all homeless and runaway children come from, guess what? A fatherless home, 90%. 85% of all the youth that are now sitting in prison, 85% of them grew up in a fatherless home. 85% of all behavioral disorders come in the form of children that have fatherless homes. Homes. 80% of all rapists that are motivated by displaced anger come from fatherless homes. 71% of all high school, drops out, high school dropouts in America come from fatherless homes. Here's my caveat before I step up on my soapbox too far. Jesus is the X factor. If you're a single mom sitting here today say, I can't do it. Yes, you can. Or actually, no, you can't. But Jesus can. I should have been one of those statistics. I could have been all of them, I guess. But it's not because I tried so hard. I was so good. Jesus came in and was the X factor for me. And with Jesus on your side, mom or a child without a dad, anything's possible. But I'd also like to speak to dads this morning. Don't ignore these statistics either. They mean something. If you're thinking about being come disconnected in the near future or maybe leaving your family behind, realize that many of Your children will look forward to these stats if you're not there without Christ. Dads have a critical role in the family. Fathers are important. Jesus saw his heavenly fathers important. In fact, when his life got crazy, when Jesus had the toughest times of his life, where did he go? To his knees, to his heavenly father, the garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus was bearing the world's sin, God's wrath was on him. He fell into the dirt on his face, on his face, and he prayed to his father. Jesus needed his father. When Jesus' ministry was exploding, growing so large, crowds were around him, he could barely move. What did he do? He would escape and talk to his father. Now, much of what we're going to read in Matthew 6, you probably already there and realize, Pastor, that's the Lord's Prayer. That's going to apply to most of you here today. But I want to tell you, there's special things in here that Jesus lifts out that I think are very important for dad. So let's look at how Jesus turned to his father in Matthew 6 as we start reading in verse 9. Jesus here is talking about prayer. That's the context. As an expository preacher, I need you to know that. But there's points we're going to pull out here that are so important for our dads. When asked how to pray, Jesus says, pray then in this way. You probably heard this before. Our Father who is in heaven... 
hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us of our trespasses or our debts or our sins as we forgive those who trespass or sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil or the evil one. And then many texts say, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. You've all heard that prayer before. Dads, fathers, your responsibility is great. And Jesus teaches us much about that responsibility in the Lord's Prayer. So let's get right into it. Matthew chapter 6, starting here in verse 9. The first thing we see for fathers is a father's priority. A father's priority. You can write that in your bulletin right there. A father's priority is critical for his family. Jesus, when he was looking to give us an example in prayer, he didn't say, here's the prayer of Jabez. This is what God can do for you. No, Jesus says, here's where the priority. He gives credit where credit is due. He says, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He doesn't start what you can get from God. He says, this is number one. This is the number one priority. You give the credit to God. Hallowed be thy name. Notice the term that Jesus uses here for God. He says, our Father. He uses that affectionate, that very personal term that a parent uses with his, I mean, a child uses with his father. But he didn't just say, my father. He could have said, hey, listen, when you're praying, say, king of the universe, you're so much more powerful than I, I can't even comprehend who you are. He says, pray to that guy. No, he didn't say that. He could have said that. That's who God is. Unfathomable for your mind to get, but he says, call him father. He's my father, but he's your father too. Do you think it's a coincidence that the same name that Jesus uses for God is the same name, dads, that our children use for us, father? No, there's a connection there. The connection there, number one, is that, dads, for you to be a successful father, your priority must be God through a relationship with Jesus Christ. There is no greater priority for you than to have God as number one. You know, I get so tired of hearing how mothers beg their fathers or wives beg their husbands to come to church on Mother's Day. Children beg their dads to come to church on Mother's Day. But then on Father's Day, dads are begging their wives and their children to let them miss church to go fishing. Church just isn't manly enough for me. I don't know when church stopped becoming manly for the father. I do believe that we need to stop feminizing our Christianity and let men be men. But I also believe that real dads love Jesus. Amen? And real dads make God as their number one priority in their life. Dads, I want to tell you this. If you're putting your priority over your fishing boat or your accounting cabin or any of your toys in life, I want to tell you this, and it's not going to sound very good, and I'm sorry, but you're a sellout. If you're putting toys above your God and above your family, you're a sellout. You're selling out your God and you're selling out your family for yourself. If you're satisfying yourself above your top two priorities, which is your family, well, God and then your family... I can't think of a more disgusting thought for a father. By the way, we talked about priorities last week, right? Number one is who? God, which is Jesus. Number one is Jesus. Number two is others. Number three is you. It was brought to my attention this week. You know what that spells? J-O-Y, joy. Fathers, if you're looking for joy in this world, it's not going to come from an escape on a weekend. It's not going to come from your money and your bank account. It's not going to come from your success in a career. If you're looking for joy, get your priorities straight. I didn't say happiness. I said joy, which can only come from God. Jesus, others, yourself. A father's priority must be God. And by the way, it's not feminine to go to church. It's not in our lineage, men. Think about your history from the Bible. Jesus He was bold and radical. The Bible calls him meek. I want to tell you, men, meek does not mean weak. Jesus was meek. It doesn't mean he was just walking around scared of everybody. No, Jesus fashioned a whip and chased people out of God's temple. Meekness is strength under control. But then you think about other Bible characters like Paul. Was Paul a girly man, guys? 
No, Paul was in prison. You ever been to prison? It's not a nice place. He spent most of his adult years when he was writing to the churches, he spent it from prison because he was so radically in love with Jesus. Think about John. Not only he was in prison, but he was on prison like we would call Alcatraz by himself on the island of Patmos. Go on through the Old Testament characters and look at their faith. Was it feminized? No, they were bold and powerful. Don't even get me started on Moses or David or Isaiah, or Jeremiah. But you say, okay, that's the Bible, Pastor. What about history? Well, I'll tell you about history. An early church father. His name was Polycarp. I don't think his Christianity was feminized. Why? Because he stood there in the Colosseum and he said, burn me alive. I'm not denying my faith. No, Polycarp didn't have his man card checked when he walked into church. What about Martin Luther when he took the 95 Theses and his courage and bravery against the church of the day, which was so basically pagan, and he nailed those 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg? Was his Christianity feminized? No, he was chased his whole life for that, and he died. The resounding answer to the question is no, it's not in our history. Men, you should be bold, you should be strong, and you should be courageous, but where does your strength come from? Not from you from God. If you're a man and you want to call yourself a real man, it's not outside of here you get your manliness. It's inside this place you get your manliness. A man's priority should be the same priority that Jesus had, God, through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Not only does the text here in Matthew chapter 6 show us that a father's priority is God, but it also shows us a father's provision. It says, give us this day our daily bread. Jesus says, pray like this. And it's a good prayer. The word, give us this day our daily bread, that clause is twofold in meaning. One, for physical provision, and two, for spiritual provision. Give us this day our daily bread. Literally, in this day, a lot of people went hungry. In fact, most of our world today struggles with hunger. Unfortunately, we live in America. I guess it is fortunate in some ways. But we don't understand that there is a need to pray to seek God for physical provision. We're not worried about necessarily where our next meal is is going to happen or not, we're worried about what restaurant we're going to go to. But give us our daily bread literally means help us with our physical provision, God. But then he says it's beyond bread. Jesus says in Matthew 4, 4, man does not live off bread alone, but from the very words that come from the mouth of God. That's spiritual provision. Everybody in here wants you to understand today. You can depend on God for spiritual provision and physical provision. And dad's you can depend on God for your physical provision and your spiritual provision. And therefore, if you can depend on God for those things, your family should be able to depend on you for physical provision and spiritual provision. Take physical provision. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 6 or verse 8, which is it here? It's 1 Timothy 5, 8. Paul says that if a man does not take care of his own household, especially his family, he has denied his faith and he's worth worse than an unbeliever. If you don't physically provide for your household, you have denied your faith and are worse than an unbeliever. Now think about that, dads, before you think about leaving your family. Before you say, I'm going to leave them behind and satisfy myself. Think about what the text says there. What does it mean that you've denied your faith? Paul cannot comprehend how a man could say, I love Jesus Christ, but I'm not going to physically provide for my family. It doesn't make sense. Because in Paul's day, the father was the place that the family could find provision in. And I want to tell you, dads, even if you're here today and you don't make any money for your family, I believe that you still bear on your shoulders the weight of responsibility for provision for your family. You may not make a dime, but you need to have that responsibility. And if you have to, do whatever you can to provide for your family. Not only does it say you've denied your faith, but you're worse than an unbeliever. Because in Paul's day, even the unbeliever knew what it meant to care for his family. Most of the time, even in the animal world, the male animal knows the care for his family. How much more should a believer physically provide for his family? But not just physical provision. Yes, Dad, you should do that. But spiritual provision as well. Why shouldn't you, dads, be the one to lead your child to faith in Jesus Christ? Why not? It shouldn't have to be your wife. It can be. It shouldn't have to be your pastor. I would love to. It doesn't have to be your child care worker, although it could. Why couldn't it be you, dads? Dads, why can't it be you that takes your children to bed at night and before they go to sleep, you pray with them. You lead them to read the word and understand the word. 
Dads, don't let your wives take your children to bed every night without you. You take them. You pray. I took that responsibility in my family, and it's not easy. Isaac can tell you, we go to bed at night, and sometimes I just want to give him a kiss. But my children, now that we've established this routine, say, Dad, and sometimes it's a time consuming, right? So I don't have to go to sleep. But just hearing those words, Daddy, would you read the Bible with us and pray with us? Daddy, we haven't read the Bible yet or prayed yet. I'm like, of course. Let's do it. No sweeter words can be heard from a Christian father than for his children to be begging him to read the word and pray with them. Provide for your family physically, but please provide for them spiritually as well. <clears throat> if you hear those words from your child, you'll be blessed. But not only physical provision and spiritual provision, but I was thinking about a dad providing for his family this week. You know another way, dad, you can provide for your family? You can provide for them emotionally. You need to tell your children and your wife that you care for them and you love them. Some dads think, well, my children will figure it out when they see food coming on the table. They know I love them. Well, you can show them, but I want to tell you, not only should you show them, you should tell them. Tell your family that you love them. Right now, dads, if you're here, if your wife's sitting next to you, look at her. You tell that woman she's beautiful. Tell her. Say, you're beautiful, and I love you, and I thank God for you. Don't just tell her today, tell her every day. And dads, I want to tell you this, if you have a daughter, you better tell her that she's beautiful. Right? Dad, you better tell your daughter that you care for her. You better tell her that you adore her, because if she doesn't get that recognition from you as the male representative in her family, she will seek it from another male representative. And you don't want that. Tell your daughters that you care for them. Most importantly, tell them that you want them to do what God has created them to do, not what the world wants them to be. There's a big difference. The TV, magazines, and the rest of the world is going to tell your little daughter what they want her to be. Sure, so does Satan. You need to tell her what God has called her to be. Tell your wife you love her. Tell your daughter you love her. Tell your sons that you love him. It's okay. Isaac, I love you. It's all right. Tell them. And so tell your son that you support him and you believe in him and everything that he does. Your children should not have to guess emotionally how you feel about him. Brett Favre, he's like 42 years old, phenomenal quarterback. Would you agree? Phenomenal quarterback. He played for like 20 years. He just finished playing. And he played every game with everything that he had. He broke almost, the rec almost all the records. But he'll tell you and his wife Deanna will tell you that much of his motivation was driven by the approval of his father. His father was his loudest critic. Barry Sanders' dad was the same. Brett Favre says he played so hard because he wanted to make his dad proud. Do you remember that game just after Brett Favre's father died? Do you remember that amazing game that he had? He wanted to make his dad proud. Now that's good. Let me tell you the bad side of that. Deanna says, his wife says, that not only was he seeking the coach's approval, but even after his father passed away, he was trying to still seek his father's approval. Why? Brett Favre himself says in a Newsweek article that my father never told me that he loved me, but I knew it. My father never told me that he was proud of me, but I knew it. And so therefore, we never told him either, but we both just knew that we loved each other. Now, I appreciate his performance in the NFL, but that's a sad story to me. Dad, your children should never have to guess how you feel about him. They should never have to say, well, I know my daddy loves me, even though he didn't tell me. No, they should say, I know my daddy loves me because he shows me and he tells me. A father's priority is God. A father's provision is for emotionally, physically, and spiritually. But the third thing we see here in this text is a father's forgiveness. Jesus in his almighty power here says, encourages us to ask for forgiveness and to forgive to give forgiveness to others. I want to tell you, forgiveness is a part of the believer's life. If you're not confessing your sin on a daily basis, you're wrong. You're committing that sin. You need to give it to God and seek him for forgiveness. And what does God do to you every time? He offers that forgiveness to you. So believers, you should seek that from God because he'll give it to you. But dads, you need to be the example of forgiveness for your family. Every single time your child seeks you for forgiveness, you should give it to them. Now what I'm not saying is that you don't have discipline. You need to discipline your children. You never need to accept sin, but you always need to love your children, and when they seek your forgiveness, you need to give it to them. Be the example of forgiveness for your family. But not only that, don't be afraid to ask your children or your wife for forgiveness. 
Don't be afraid to say, you know what? I was wrong. Look in this text here. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15, Jesus says, If you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Do you get that? That's the job description of a believer. Because you've been forgiven, you have to show forgiveness. It's not an option. Because how can you not show forgiveness when God's overwhelming love has come upon you? Dads, be the example of forgiveness for your family, both giving them forgiveness and asking them forgiveness. Let them learn forgiveness by watching you forgive. So yes, the Father's priority is God. A Father's provision is both emotionally, physically, and spiritually. But we, next we see here not only is a Father an example of forgiveness, but let's look at a Father's faithfulness. Right here in the text, Jesus says, you pray, not only that this forgiveness that you'd be able to give it to others or receive it from others or receive it from others and give it to others but he says deliver us from evil lead us not into temptation now we think this is just a simple prayer that when we say god lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil that god's just going to make that happen no no i don't think it works like that i think when you ask god to not lead you in temptation what he does is he leads you on this road and he shows you here's a pitfall of temptation here's a pitfall of temptation Here's a pitfall of temptation. Then it's up to you to avoid it. When you ask God to lead you not into temptation, he'll show you those areas of temptation. But then it's your responsibility as a believer and especially as a father to be the example of faithfulness and avoid those pitfalls of temptation yourself. Be that example of faithfulness for your family. Let your family see you avoiding temptation. Don't pretend like it's not there, by the way, dads. We don't like to admit things. Temptation's there. Jesus Christ was tempted. Look back at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. It says, For we do not have a high priest, who is Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Jesus Christ is your model of faithfulness by not falling into temptation ever. Dad, you're not going to be perfect, but you need to be the model for your family of faithfulness by not falling into temptation of putting other things as more important than your family. Not falling into the temptation of not getting out, or getting out of the habit of going to church or the temptation of looking at your computer screen in inappropriate ways or any other temptation. Be the example of faithfulness for your family. I'd like to talk a moment to all you here today who are just kind of overwhelmed. Say, Pastor, I'm a single mom. Pastor, I'm a child that doesn't have an example, a good example as a father. I got good news for you today. The priority of God, the provision of God, the forgiveness of God, and the faithfulness of God doesn't only have to come from your earthly father. If you need it here today and he's not there, you can get it from your heavenly father. If you don't have an earthly father as an example, you can turn to your heavenly father as an example. It's not alleviating you, dads, your responsibility, but those who have to turn to that area, turn to that area. I remember many times when I had no example to follow. I made a lot of mistakes because of that, but I always had my heavenly father to turn to as my example. If you need to use that, use that. So dads, I got just a couple questions for you this morning. Yes, Jesus is the X factor, but I want to ask you, Dads, what kind of dads are you? I have three chairs up here. They represent a first string dad, a second string dad, and a third string dad. Let me explain. A first string dad is that dad who loves Jesus Christ with all of his heart. That dad that has grown in his faith. He's on fire for the Lord, and he's teaching his children to do the same. Are you a first string dad? I want to tell you the percentages say that in church, most of you are not. So there's the second string dad. This is most American fathers today who claim to be Christians. This is the dad who goes to church most of the time, is probably a believer. But Jesus Christ isn't doing anything really radical in his life. And this dad is kind of complacent. He says, I'm comfortable in my faith. I got my thing with God, and yeah, I know Jesus, but I'm comfortable here. That's the second string dad. Then you have the third string dad. At least they're honest. This is the pagan. This is the person who doesn't know Jesus, is not a believer, doesn't want to know Jesus, who sees Christianity as a crutch, and they say, I want no part of it. But I'm not going to hide it. I just don't believe in Jesus. Are you a first string, second string, or third string dad? 
Let me tell you that first string dads, you know what they have? They have sons that are overwhelmingly first string dads. A first string dad who loves Jesus with everything that he has and teaches his children to do the same will have sons that are first string dads almost every time. Third string dads, guess what they have? Sons that are overwhelmingly third string dads. A pagan produces a pagan almost every time. Jesus is the X factor, but here's what's going to blow your mind. Many fathers today who are in churches are second string dads. You know what second string dads have? They have sons that are third string dads. A lukewarm father will not produce a lukewarm son. A lukewarm father will produce a pagan that's a son. Why? Because the child sees the father that has no Jesus in their life that's making any real movements. They're just satisfied where they're at. They see hypocrisy in their father. And I want to tell you, your children want nothing to do with that kind of faith. I'm pleading with you, dads. Be a first string dad. Let God be your priority. Provide for your children physically, emotionally, but most important, spiritually. Be the example of forgiveness in your family. Be the example of faithfulness in your family and watch your sons and daughters, not every time, but more likely than not, to be first string children. In the words of the Courageous movie, I want to end with this. In my house, my house, the decision has already been made. You don't have to ask who will lead my family because by God's grace, I want to tell you, I will. You don't have to ask who will teach my sons, Isaac and Christian, to follow Jesus. And who will teach my daughter, Autumn, to follow Jesus with everything they have. Why? Because I will. Who will provide for my family? Who will protect for my family? I will. Who will break the chains of sinfulness that has passed down to me and my family line? I will. Who will pray for my children and boldly support them to follow God's will, not their own? I will. I want God's blessing in my home, and I want his favor. So where are you, men of courage? Where are you, fathers who fear the Lord? It's time for you to rise up and answer God's call in your life to stand up and say, I will. Where are you at this morning? I will. I will. Where are you at, dads? I will. I will. will you? I will. I will. I will. Stand up. If you're a dad here today and you feel that call, say, I will. I will. Because I will. Will you? Here's my invitation. Becky, you come up and sing. Dads, if you're standing up and you're going to answer that call, whether it's your first time or you've lived a lifelong time of doing this, come forward this morning. Dads, don't be afraid. Be bold. Come forward and come to the altar. I'm not going to ask you for any other decision other than to pray that God will allow you to be the man he has called you to be. And as you come to this altar and pray, I'm going to pray for you in just a second. Dad, you pray to God that he will help you be the man you want to be. And as Becky sings, everybody else here today, this should encourage you. Dad, you go ahead and start praying. That's what you need to be doing. Moms and daughters, maybe conflicted emotions in the audience, you be praying as well. And if this motivates you to make a decision today, maybe even waiting to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, do it today. Your fathers are bold enough to make a decision, are you? Maybe you're here today and you need to join the church. Maybe you're here today and you need to be baptized. Whatever everybody else's decision is, as we sing, these fathers pray. I will pray over them in just a second. You come. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved.
Dad, you keep praying. Everybody else, as they're praying, reach out your hands. You may not be able to touch them. Everybody else, just put out your hands towards these fathers, and I want to pray over them with you this morning. Holy Spirit, thank you for your movement in these dads' lives. Thank you that they have the courage in the midst of a world that says, you don't admit anything. You don't stand up for anything. You just kind of go with the flow, Father. They were willing to stand up and say, I will lead my family with your help. God, I pray that you would give them your strength and not their own. God, I pray over these fathers that they would stand up and be strong and courageous with the power not of their own, but of you, Jesus Christ, through them, and they would lead their families. We will, with your help, together. Use this decision to change Tabernacle and our city. In Jesus' name we all pray, amen.